Hey, good uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, our annual Jewish History Lecture Series. Uh, Last year, we had a three-part series, I think it was entitled uh, Critical Conversations, or Critical Controversies, I believe, and we talked about uh, three critical controversies that uh, shaped the trajectory of uh, Jewish history. This year, we're doing something a little bit different. We're discussing the uh, the history and the philosophy of the Zionist movement. It's really... uh, Honor for me to have uh, my name on the same flyer as Rabbi Reiner. Oh gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Reiner is a uh, Rabbi Reiner is a is a noted historian and uh, really a very well respected member of our community. And we thank Rabbi Reiner for putting the time to prepare the lecture. And I know that I am excited to be learning from you, as uh, well as everybody else who has come today. So without further ado, thank you, for Rabbi you. Reiner. Thank you. Good boy. For that kind of a uh, of an introduction, everything was worthwhile. Stop, Jack, you should stop there. Pardon? Yeah. Stop there. Stop over here, Fertig. <laughs> Goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about the uh, development of Jewish national consciousness. You'll understand what I mean as we go along. Uh, Jewish nationalistic development according to the historical annals, began its development in the mid and the latter part of the 19th century, the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s. And historians ask why? I mean, what was it about the 19th century that it should serve as the climate for the development of a Jewish national character? One answer given, and it's a good answer, is that the 19th century generally is known as the age of nationalism. In the course of this century, countries throughout Europe consolidate and declare their independence. This is true of Germany, this is true of Austria, it's especially true of Italy. Italy, until the 19th century, consisted of a series of several states which were dominated by foreign powers. And in the 19th century, Giuseppe Mazzini, due to his effective efforts, brought about an independent and unified Italy, which was a major nationalistic development. It was the age of nationalism. And as will be seen, it's possible that these nationalistic tendencies, especially the one in Italy, may have impacted the development of Jewish nationalism. You know, there's a Jewish cliche, a Jewish proverb that says, that what happens amongst the Christians ultimately happens amongst the Jews as well. But there is a more direct reason for this development in the 19th century. In the start of the century, Jews were already largely emancipated in Western Europe. Uh, Medieval restrictions were eliminated, citizenship was granted, universities were open, occupations and professions were available, there was free mobility, there was free settlement, but it was not yet complete. There were still problems, the Jews were still not liked, there was still not free mingling, there was still no open friendship, and the premise was that what was the reason for this negative view of the Jews? Because Judaism is a unique kind of a religion, it has unique practices, peculiar dress, peculiar modes of worship, isolationist rules, Shabbat, Kashrut, and as a result of these unusual circumstances, Jews are not yet accepted in general society. The only remedy, the only way to solve this situation is to, in order to hasten the fullness of emancipation, we must have total assimilation. Changes in all areas so that the Jew would emerge similar to all of the people in the environment, in society, and this will bring the remedy to all of the Jewish ills. And this happened. Uh, Reform Judaism emerged in the 19th century. It was popular, widespread. It was the answer to all the problems. By the latter part of the century, everything was in effect. Ethnic 
procedures were eliminated. Germanic dress, we dressed like the Germans. Synagogues were like the Lutheran churches. Kashrut was eliminated. Sabbath rules were relaxed. There was even a movement to change the Shabbat day into Sunday, which was the societal day of rest. Any concept of Jewish uniqueness gave way. Any notion of Jewish peoplehood was gone. Any concept of a Messiah, any quest and aspiration for Eretz Yisrael, everything was gone and every reference to it was removed from the Siddur, from the prayer book. The principle was Deutschland ist unser Palestina, Berlin ist unser Jerusalem. That Germany is our Palestine and Berlin is our Jerusalem. Everything seemingly now was perfect. The maximum of assimilation was in effect, and now assimil assimilation was complete, and everything should be perfect and hunky dory. And then came the latter part of the 18th of the 19th century. In Eastern Europe, beginning with the 1880s, came intensive pogroms, intensive anti-Semitic sentiments. In Western Europe and France, in 1886, Edward Drummond wrote his famous book, La France Juive, meaning Jewish France, which meant that every ill, everything wrong in France is the result of the Jews. This was widely assimilated, this was widely circulated, continually republished. Everything was the fault of the Jews. If there would have been a New York Times then, this would have been on the top of the list of the best sellers with a magnificent book review. Then came the Dreyfus Affair in 1894, a few days later, where Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish military official, we spoke about that some time ago, who was found guilty as a result of a miscarriage of justice. He was found guilty of treason, and an attempt was made to project this concept of treason to the totality of the Jewish community. All Jews are traitors, and all are all they do is aim to control society. All of them are guilty of treason and widespread anti-Semitism begins to emerge. Why? We did everything. We assimilated. We're like all others. We changed our dress. We changed our names. We changed our laws. We act and look like others. Why are we still viewed with suspicion? Why the anti-Semitism? We did everything that was demanded of us. This emerging anti-Semitism caused a disillusion with assimilation as a solution. According to many historical annals, we find, and we're going to see that today in our talk, that many personalities who began as being spokesmen for assimilationism changed their ways, and they altered their approach, and they begin to emerge as Jewish nationalists. They, was, they were honest enough to be able to look themselves in the mirror and to say, we were wrong. Assimilation is indeed not the answer. The world doesn't let us assimilate. The world insists that we are a unique people, that we are a people different. And if that is so, then we should work upon that difference, that we should develop that difference. And with this begins the development of Jewish nationalistic character. Uh, Zionism, when we mention Zionism, Theodor Herzl comes to mind. And there's a reason, good reason for it. He certainly is a very significant figure in the development of Zionism. But he wasn't the origin of Zionist thought. There were a number of significant personalities before him who underwent this very dramatic transformation in their careers. And as a result of this change, and as a result of their essays and their writings, they emerge as the forerunners of Zionism even before Herzl. And I'm going to talk about a number of them. Some of them you may have heard of and some you may not have heard of. I have a lot of notes, but the only reason why I have a lot of notes is because much of what I'm going to say today are not my words, 
but I rather excerpts from the writings of these people because it's important to hear what those people said, not my interpretation of them. You have my interpretation also, but important to hear how did they phrase their new approach to the new situation. The first one that I'm going to refer to, I don't know if you ever heard of him, maybe you did, was Moses Hess. Moses Hess. Moses Hess lived between 1812 and 1875. Uh, Moses Hess is a very significant figure. Uh, he began as an assimilationist. Uh, according to Hess, the Jews in modern times have a future only as individuals, and they should merge into the general universal society. He wrote a book called The Holy History of Mankind in 1837, where he writes that from the appearance of Jesus on the historical scene, uh, all Jews, all Jewish contribution to history is gone. To the, what the, Jew, the Jewish contribution to history was monotheism, with the emergence of Jesus, this was accepted by civilization, and from that point and on, the Jews have a future only as individuals. The last chapter of that book is entitled The New Jerusalem, and he writes that here in the heart of Europe, that New Jerusalem will be built, having nothing at all to do with a Palestine, with anything, it's all a European approach, no such concept of a Jewish nationalistic identity. It's totally, totally gone. And then came the rise of anti-Semitism. And it had a profound effect on Hess and on his assimilationist approach. And he wrote a second book that you may be familiar with. It's called Rome and Jerusalem. Rome and Jerusalem. It's subtitled, The Last National Problem. It's a radical departure from his previous views. Hess now views Judaism in national terms. The Rome that he speaks of, Rome and Jerusalem, is the Rome of Mazzini, which we had mentioned earlier, the rise of Italian nationalism. He views this as the stimulus for the rise of Jewish nationalism. I'm going to quote with the liberation of the eternal city on the Tiber, which is Rome, begins the liberation of the eternal city on Mount Moriah, which is Jerusalem. With the resurrection of Italy begins the resurrection of Judea. The orphan children of Jerusalem will also be permitted in the great renaissance of nations. He argues now against Reform Judaism. Because Reform Judaism attempted to squelch the nationalistic spirit, and now he feels openly and speaks openly against them how wrong they are. Listen to the way he writes. This is a total about Shuvi. You know, Moses Hess was born to an Orthodox family, but he divorced himself from religious Judaism very, very early on, and he intermarried. And in those days, intermarriage was very, very uncommon. So you can see what kind of a person he was. Now listen to the way he talks. Here do I stand once more, after 20 years of estrangement in the midst of my own people. A thought which I believe I had repressed has come to life once more. The thought of my nation, inseparable from the heritage of my ancestors, from the Holy Land and the Eternal City, with the belief in the divine unity of life and the future brotherhood of man was born. Jews are now a nation. Jews are like all others, with a phenomenal quest and with a phenomenal contribution. It's to be noted that in these nationalistic tendencies of Moses S., his early socialist doctrines remained intact. The projected Jewish society in Palestine, in his books, was going to be a socialist society with a very vital Jewish proletariat, with a Jewish socialist commonwealth, with public ownership of land, with production organized according to cooperative and according to collective lines. Moses Hess can well be viewed 
as the founder, or at least as the origin of labor Zionism, which develop, develops later on. Uh, the next individual was a gentleman whose name was Eliezer Perlman, whom you may better know by his pen name, Eliezer ben Yehuda. Eliezer ben Yehuda is known as the father of the Hebrew language. He was the one, he prepared the first modern dictionary of the Hebrew language. He also was born to an Orthodox family. He was a student in a Lithuanian yeshiva. He then became a medical student in Paris and he stopped in the middle and he emigrated to Palestine in, 18, in 1881, right in the midst of all of these difficulties. He insists that Hebrew must be a nece the necessary language that must be studied and learned by the people in order to be able to assume and to gain nationhood. And for the Hebrew to become a national and an ordinary language, this development can only be had in a society which speaks Hebrew. He writes, we will be able to revive the Hebrew tongue only in a country in which the number of Hebrew inhabitants exceeds the number of Gentiles. Let us increase the numbers of Jews in our desolate land. Let the remnants of our people return to the land of their fathers. Let us revive the nation and its tongue will be revived as well. They tell the story that he met his wife, uh, her name was Deborah, and they went to Egypt and they were married in Egypt, but he married her on condition that once a child was born, she will not speak to that child only in Hebrew. And it was done. They never divorced, so obviously she kept to that particular promise. So that's Eliezer ben Yehuda and his contribution to Jewish nationalism. An outstanding example of this type of drastic, severe transformation within a person is in the person of Bernard Lazar. I don't know if you ever heard of Bernard Lazar a very significant individual, hardly ever referred to. He ultimately became a, he had a decisive role in the, in the Dreyfus affair. However, this was not always his approach. Lazar at the outset totally rejected any concept of Jewish nationalistic identity. This initial approach of his is reflected, as we're going to see, in his attitude towards the Russian Jews who escaped the Tsar and came to France, and he didn't want them admitted. You'll see that in a moment. What he believed in, and he writes this in his, in, in his uh, authorship, in his writings, the anti-Semitism was the result of a confusion that developed in society with regards to the Jews. Who is a Jew? And he distinguishes between two types of Jews. The first is the Juif. The Juif is, is a French term for Jew, but it's not just a, a, a translation. It's a very, it's a derogatory term of a Jew. It's like, in English, a kaik. The Juif is the one who is portrayed in anti-Semitic literature. Uh, he is the one whose primary concern is to become wealthy as quickly as possible, regardless of the means employed. He is the one who's uncouth, he's uneducated, that's the Eastern European Jew. The other is the Israelite. The Israelite is the refined Hebrew, limited in his material desires, he's educated, and is assimilated in French society. And Lazar believed that the anti-Semitic charges against the Juif are substantiated. He himself has the same views regarding them as all the others. And that the Israelites must totally disassociate themselves from these Eastern Europeans with whom they have nothing in common. As I mentioned earlier, when these refugees from Russia came to France, he writes to welcome these contemptible people to our country to help them, to patronize them, to implant them in a soil which is not theirs. Why? In order to facilitate their conquest? For whose benefit is this? Thanks to these hordes with whom we are confused, 
It is forgotten that for about 2,000 years we have lived here in France. What I want to insist upon publicly is that we have nothing whatsoever in common with them who are constantly thrown into our faces and that we must abandon them. That's his approach to his fellow Jews from Eastern Europe. Lazar not only believed in assimilation, but in total assimilation, the total disappearance of the Jew, that this will end anti-Semitism. It's, it's the only answer. I remember when I was in Bell Harbor, and uh, we were looking to put up an Arab. We had a lot of problems. The community was up against us completely, and we tried really to combat them. And uh, there was one priest with whom I was rather friendly, I don't know why, and his name was Jack Kelly, Father Kelly. He came to see me once in my office and he says, Rabbi Reiner, why don't you take back that project? Stop working on the Arab. You don't need that Arab. And if you eliminate the Arab, all of these problems are going to stop. I told him, sure. Eliminate the Jews, and there won't be any anti-Semitism anymore. That's what it is. This is what they, that's what they felt. The total assimilation. If we remove the Jews from history, then of course there's not going to be any hatred of the Jews anymore. So Lazar believed in this total assimilation period. In his essays of 1891, he's critical of himself. He's sorry, he says, that he was born a Jew. He says, well, it's not my fault. This is his approach. But as he delved further into the nature of anti-Semitism, and, and he was stimulated, motivated to do this, when Drummond came out with his book, and that book became so vastly popular, and he couldn't understand why is that book so popular. He, re he realized that it's based on lies, and why is it so popularly accepted? He began to delve into the development of anti-Semitism, and he was going to prepare a, an extensive study. He was going to publish an extensive study of this. He begins to think in altogether different terms. He begins now to think of the Jews in national terms, very, very distant, foreign from what he had entertained earlier, that there exists a fundamental unity between the Jewish people, a unifying force that binds them as a people. He says, although, he says, Judaism consists of a variety of people, diverse elements, there exists a basic unity of sentiments, national consciousness, fortified by a belief in a Jewish supremacy. He says even the Jew who lost his religious faith is still part of this tradition, and he still is shaped by what he calls the Judengeist, the very special Jewish spirit that marks him as a Jew. He writes, the Jew, even the extreme Jewish radical, cannot help retaining his Jewish characteristics. And although he may have abandoned all religious faith, he has nonetheless received the impress of the national genius acting through heredity and early training. Anti-Semitism to him is no longer the result of a confusion between the Jewish and the Israelite. Now it's the fault of society. He says, conservative class, conservative society refuses to confront change of any sort and refuses to recognize the genius and the potential contribution of a people because it has differing, differing ideas and a different character. He says, anti-Semitism is the result of a hostile atmosphere in society. It's no longer the fault of the Jewish people. And now he commends the Jews who never succumbed to assimilation. He is a man who preached total assimilation. And now he commends the people who didn't listen to him from the outset. A phenomenal transformation in his own, in his own approach. The Tsar concluded that there was no solution for anti-Semitism it existed as long as Christianity existed and will continue to exist. The duty of the Jew is not to, co is not to eliminate anti-Semitism, you cannot do that, but to combat anti-Semitism. Every human creature, I'm quoting, 
if he has the will to exist, must know how to resist. He must make every effort to maintain his liberty of being and his liberty of being himself. And then he goes on to speak of himself in terms of the Jewish people. He says, we have always been the old stiff-necked people. It's amazing how he talks a totally different language. The intractable rebel nation. We want to be ourselves, what our forefathers, our history, our traditions, our culture, and our memories have made us. And we will know well how to win that right which is ours, not only to be men, but also to be Jews. So he called openly to resist anti-Semitism and to survive as a result of national awareness that all other attempts are futile and corrupt. This is this gentleman, it's a far cry from his earlier public emphasis on the assimilationist philosophy and the repudiation of Jewish identification. One other that I want to speak of, and that's Leon Pinsker. Some of you may have heard of Leon Pinsker. He wrote a pamphlet in 1882 called Auto Emancipation. Auto Emancipation. He's an Eastern European. He was a Russian masculine who lived in Odessa. And he openly now challenges the concept of emancipation. He is, uh, he says the emancipation is based on the assumption that the Jews are a passive object of historical development, that other people have to liberate the Jew. Other people have to award the Jews rights. Other people have to treat them with equality. The historical subject is the non-Jewish world, and the Jews remain as a passive element waiting to be emancipated by others. This will never work. In auto emancipation, he writes, that auto emancipation is necessary, self-determination. The Jews have to become reintegrated in the historical process, conscious of themselves and the historical activity. To Pinsker, Galut, Exile meant the deprivation of a Jewish role in history. And freedom, he says, is not a gift to be given to the Jews by others. And he quotes the Pelik, Im Einanili Mili. If I am not going to do it for myself, no one is going to do it for me. This is the theme of his pamphlet, Auto Emancipation. And the closing sentence of the pamphlet is, help yourselves and God will help you. In the context of the massacres of 1881, Pinsker insists that the Jews are a nation like all others, except that we are an anomaly, which distorts our relationship with others. On the one hand, society treats the Jews as members of an alien nation, on the other hand, they do not grant the Jews the rights that they normally give to other nations. And the reason is because the Jews are different. Why? Because we lack the attribute of a nation. And what's the attribute of a nation? A state of their own. The Jews do not have a state of their own. And the result is trauma and fear. And he coins a term. He calls it Judeophobia that people become afraid of the Jews because they are so different. He writes as follows, along with a number of other superstitious ideas, Judeophobia also has become naturalized among all the peoples of the earth with whom the Jews have come into contact. And the remedy is to, re to remove this Jewish abnormality. The Jews need a homeland to emerge as a normal people. And only then will Judeophobia dissipate. And to achieve this, activism, auto-emancipation is necessary. An organization, leadership, 
to enlist the recognition and assistance of the world leaders to organize systematic immigration. He suggests an infrastructure of leadership which would be the basis for a national congress which seemingly served as the basis for the Zionist Congress that was initiated by Herzl. He speaks of a national fund to purchase land and finance immigration which speaks of the ultimate development of the Jewish National Fund. It's a firm call, an open call for Jewish statehood, the open advance from national consciousness to national statehood. It's important to note, interestingly, that Pinsky was not initially firmly insistent that this Jewish state be in Palestine. It could be an alternative, he says. The essential element is that there be a Jewish state which would give a sense of normalcy to the Jewish people. Although he would prefer Palestine, but only from a pragmatic perspective, because it's more feasible for that to be the homeland. But it doesn't have to be there. We're going to look, listen, I'm going to quote from him. If we would have a secure home, so that we may give up the endless life of wandering and rehabilitate our nation in our own eyes and in the eyes of the world. We must above all not dream of restoring ancient Judea. We must not attach ourselves to the place where our political life was once violently interrupted and destroyed. The goal of our endeavors must be not the Holy Land, but a land of our own, wherever that may be. Perhaps the Holy Land will again become ours, if so, all the better. But first of all, we must determine, and this is the critical point, what country is accessible to us and adapted to offer the Jews of all lands a secure and unquestioned refuge capable of being productive, no matter where in the world that is. You should know, though, that if at the beginning, at the outset, he was not insistent on Eretz Yisrael. Ultimately, he became the president of Chovevei Zion, and he, he did accept this. But this approach, this is the approach of political Zionism, that the Eretz Yisrael is not the necessary location, absolutely necessary location for the Jewish state. If you know your history, Herzl, I think it was at the fourth Zionist Congress, came forth with the suggestion that Uganda well, when, of course, then all the, the, the people walked out and he saw that that wasn't for them. But even way before Herzl, how many of you ever heard of Mordechai Emanuel Noah? Oh, okay. Mordechai Emanuel Noah uh, lived in Philadelphia. And uh, he lived, he was born in 1785 and he died in 1851. Very interesting gentleman. He was the first Jew born in the United States to reach national Prominence. He was a very prominent Jew in America. He was a, an admiral, he was in the Navy, he did all sorts of things. Anyway, in 1825, he had no support from anyone, not even his fellow Jews. He tried to found a Jewish state in America. A Jewish refuge, he called it, on Grand Island, in the Niagara River. And he was going to give it the name Ararat. Why, why Ararat? Because his name was Noah. So where did the David stop? So he purchased, he purchased the land on Grand Island for $4.38 an acre to build a refuge for all Jews. And he bought it and he put, it came with a cornerstone. And the cornerstone reads, Ararat, a city of refuge for the Jews, founded by Mordechai M. Noah, in the month of Tishrei 5586, September 1825, in the 50th year of American independence. He was quite a guy. On September the 2nd, he arrived in Buffalo from New York with thousands of Christians and only a smattering of Jews, and they assembled for a historic event to lay the cornerstone. And he led a large procession headed by the Masons, a new militia company and municipal leaders and they marched to St. Paul's Episcopal Church and over there they had a cornerstone laying ceremony. 
I don't know where that cornerstone is. I think it's in one of the uh, museums in Philadelphia at this time. So you have another indicate another another such kind of an approach that we need a Jewish state, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in a Eretz Yisrael. All right. So we noted a number of individuals who played an important role in the development of the Zionist or the Jewish nationalist ideas, but there's one other area of development that I want to turn to. It's not going to take long. Excuse me. <laughs> and this is a development in the Orthodox circles, in Orthodox Judaism at this time. Now, the Orthodox Jews didn't need the anti-Semitism of the 19th century to develop a nationalist ideas. For thousands of years, we were praying looking forward to the rebuilding of the temple and the return to Zion and so on. But there was a development necessary and it came. And there were two prominent personalities in this development, a Svaradi and an Ashkenazi, the Svaradi was Rabbi Yehuda Chai Alkali, and the Ashkenazi was Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Kalisha. What did they do? The majority of the rabbinic writings regarding Mashiach, regarding a return to Eretz Yisrael, all place this return and the nationalistic developments squarely with the Almighty God. It's all up to him. Whenever he feels it's the right time, he'll press the right button and the Messiah will come and lead all of us to Yerushalayim and to Eretz Israel into a new kind of a millennium, the Messianic era. And all we are obligated to do is to pray that Mashiach should come quickly in our own day. That's our only obligation. In this, they introduced, to this they introduced a change. What they wanted to do was to demystify this messianic concept and to introduce a human element into a return to Eretz Yisrael. They both, it's interesting that they, they never knew each other, they never spoke to each other, they never corresponded with each other. They lived at about the same time and they wrote almost exactly in the same language, in the same phraseology, it's amazing. Al-Kalai wrote a sefer called Minchat Yehuda, The Offering of Judah, it's in 1845. What he says is that Mashiach, Mashiach will not appear suddenly, but he has to be preceded by certain preparatory processes. Certain things have to be done in order to facilitate his arrival. I'm quoting, the Lord desires that we will be redeemed in dignity. We cannot therefore migrate in a mess, for we would then have to live like tent dwellers all over the fields in the Holy Land. Redemption must come slowly. The land must be by degrees built up and prepared. Redemption is not merely a divine affair, he thought, it becomes a human concern as well. And this demystification of the redemption process brings Alkali to the notion of language, that Hebrew must become the spoken language by all Jews, otherwise we can't have a return. If the Almighty should show us his merciless favor and gather us into our land, we would not be able to speak to each other, and such a divided community could not succeed. This sort of thing is not accomplished by a miracle. It is impossible to imagine a true revival of our Hebrew language by miraculous means. It must be prepared and worked upon. And then he says, if we do this, God Almighty will inspire our teachers and the students, the boys and the girls, will learn to speak Hebrew fluently. Alkali becomes very pragmatic in his approach and also that we have to establish a leadership, we have to be involved in the purchase of land in Palestine, we have to establish a fund and so on. This is Alkali. Then let's take a look at Palisha. Almost exactly the same as Alkali. Same era, same synthesis and same approach to Gula. He wrote a sefer called Drishat Zion, seeking Zion, 
which was first published in 1862. Listen to what he writes, and here Italy comes to play. Why did the people of Italy and other countries sacrifice their lives for the land of their fathers, while we, like men bereft of strength and courage, do nothing? Are we inferior to all other peoples? He says no. And he, like Alkali, he suggests human effort is necessary. The redemption of Israel for which we long is not to be imagined as a sudden miracle. The Almighty, blessed be his name, will not suddenly descend from on, from on high and command his people to go forth. For the redemption of Israel will come by slow degrees, and the ray of deliverance will shine forth gradually. And he goes on to suggest that there must be first Jewish settlement in the land. Without such settlement, how can the, how can the ingathering begin? Both Alkali and Kalisher brought the nationalistic theme home to the tradition Jewish population, and they're to be credited undoubtedly as the forerunners of religious Zionism. By that I mean Mizrahi, Apoel Mizrahi, Mizrahi women, uh, Bani Akiva, Amit, Amuna, and what have you. You know, historically, both of these were not received at all in any part of the Jewish world. Not in Eastern Europe and not in Western Europe. In Western Europe, which was dominated by Reform Judaism, Alkali and Kalisha spoke about Mashiach. They had no room for Mashiach in their, uh, in, in their Reform approach. So they rejected him. In Eastern Europe, where the people were primarily Orthodox in the Pale of Settlement, he was too, he was too modern for them. The idea that Jews must participate and hold Mashiach's hand in order to bring him forth, this to them was sacrilege. And it didn't, it took almost a century for this to be accepted in the Orthodox circles and for Orthodox Judaism to emerge. These are some of the developments before Herzl, before Zionism. So you can see this wasn't the work of one person. It was an ongoing kind of a development which ultimately came to Herzl and then we had the Balfour Declaration, and then we had Nebuchadnezzar Holocaust, and then came the State of Israel, which we have now with all of the miracles, and as a result of a miracle that Israel exists. So we are doing our share, I think, in building up Israel. We are following Kalisher and, and Alkali. We, are, we want to bring Mashiach. And so I think that we could properly pray with good reason we could pray for Biyat HaMashiach and Sheyibane Beit HaMikdash Meher Yameinu and anticipate that as a result of our efforts and as a result of our participation that we have prepared the way for him to come and that we in our own day will be able to benefit and rejoice in the light and the radiance of a Messianic era. A pleasure to speak to you ladies and gentlemen. Take this opportunity to thank our runner again, and everyone is invited back to uh, the second segment of this lecture series on December 21st. And we'll talk about the philosophies surrounding uh, Zionism. And don't forget to come to that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you all. Yes. Yes.